So wanted to welcome you guys all again um, and uh, and talk about uh, the, the, all the things that are, are going on in the eviction world. And 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 with that, Molly Hamrick, who is uh, um, the chairman of of the PAG, and 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 we cannot thank enough. She has done an amazing job. And, and I know she'll interrupt at any moment to, to thank her uh, committee members, but there's time enough for Molly to do that. Right now, uh, we, we need to, to, to express our gratitude for Molly. Th these are not easy uh, issues that we're dealing with. And so um, we really, really want to thank her for that. Chris Bishop, our uh, current uh, Nevada um, uh, realtor president, um, picked the right peg, picked the right group to get together. Um, and who would have thought back uh, just a few months ago what was going to happen with all this? So um, with that, it looks like, Molly, it looks like we've kind of stopped uh, building up. So it looks like pretty much everybody's there. Uh, so once again, golf clap for Molly. She is the chair of the uh, of Cola Anchor. She's the uh, uh, chair of our PEG, and uh, she will lead us through the rest of this webinar. And again, from me, thank you, Molly. You've done a great job. Well, thank you, Keith. I appreciate that introduction and golf clap. I don't think I've heard that one before. Um, so something, something new every day. Um, good afternoon and thank you for joining this very important webinar that uh, your NVR and LVR leadership teams and our PM PAD hopes will assist you to better understand the recent CDC moratorium on evictions, as well as Governor Sisolak's 031 directive regarding the Nevada eviction moratorium for past due rents. As many are aware, the PAD was appointed as Keith said earlier, informed by your NVR president, Kip, Kip, sorry, Chris Bishop, nearly six months ago to assist in educating NVR realtors about the various aspects of the CARES Act and the governor's directives, as well as to depart best practices in navigating the many property management challenges that we have faced during 2020, and we have faced a lot. Um, the PAG has also worked diligently with local and state organizations and governmental agencies to determine how to best work together to achieve fair outcomes for all those affected by the pandemic. I don't believe anyone could have foreseen what has taken place these past six months, nor can we predict how the next six will play out. What we do know is that real estate is and will remain essential, and that every day that you get up, suit up, and, re and represent your clients, in this noble profession is a great day for all. I encourage you to continue to be awesome and to educate yourself and your clients as knowledge will separate the mediocre from the exceptional. With that said, I wanna thank the dedicated and hardworking members of the PAG, several of which are on our call today. Please help me welcome Vonda Nabala, a signature real estate, Teresa McKee, our CEO, Tiffany Banks and Crystal Keegan from the NBR Legal, and we also have some very special guests joining us. We have State Treasurer Zach Conine, who joined us for a webinar in July. He'll be joining us shortly to update us on the tenant relief programs, how they have fared, and what the future holds for relief efforts. We also have Chief, Jeopardy, Chief Deputy Attorney General Mark Kruger, who has also joined us in past webinars and, was, and is with us again today to help navigate the enforcement of the interplay between the CDC eviction moratorium and Nevada's moratorium. But first, we are very lucky to have Megan Booth from us, with us from the National Association of Realtors. Megan is the NAR's Director of Federal Housing, Valuation, Commercial Real Estate and Policy and Programs. She has also been closely following the CDC order regarding eviction moratoriums and will give us an update on NAR's actions in response to this order. A little bit of housekeeping, we want to remind you that the chat is open, but we ask that you write down questions as our presenters are speaking versus putting them directly into the chat and then find out if they've answered those questions during their presentation. We know we expect to have several uh, lots and lots of questions today. And we want to be able to answer all the questions. We want to keep the chat as clean as possible. And we also want to make sure that we are remembering to address the topics that are at hand today and that we don't really go off topic because again, we want to get everybody's questions with nearly 400 people on today. We're going to have a lot of questions. Uh, so with that said, Megan, welcome. Thanks so much, Molly, and thank all of you for, um, for coming to um, hear about this today. There's been a lot of questions around the CDC order, so I'm happy to be here to tell you more about it. So the CDC order was published effective September 4th and it runs through December 31st of this year. And it was sort of the outgrowth of an order of an executive order put out by the president on August 8th that directed the CDC and Health and Human Services to look at any provisions such as an eviction moratorium that might be necessary to stop the spread of COVID. 
So the notice that came out from the CDC is an agency order and it is under the Pu Public Health Act and it was it's designed to stop the spread of COVID. It applies to all rental units across the United States with the exception of American Samoa, who apparently has a very low um, transmission rate of COVID. And, um, and except for those states that have a more restrictive rule, and I know that later you're gonna hear about how this um, interacts with your rules here in, uh, in Nevada. So um, otherwise it applies to every rental unit. All that a renter has to do to be eligible for this eviction moratorium is um, to self-certify under the penalty of perjury that they meet um, several main criteria. These criteria are, number one, that they make less than $99,000 this year, or $198 if they file jointly. There's a few other criteria around it, but that's sort of the gist of it. That they have used their best efforts to get rental assistance or housing assistance from the government. That they are unable to pay all of their rent or a part of their rent due to a loss of income, a loss of wages, a loss of hours, or they have um, extraordinary medical bills. Note that these do not have to be related to COVID-19. And um, lastly, that they, if they are evicted, they would um, have to move into, become homeless, have to move into a homeless shelter, or have to move into housing that is um, more densely crowded than the housing that they currently live in. So that's the res resident declaration. This, there is a form that's attached to the CDC notice that a resident may fill out. However, they are not required to use that form. They can just write these attestations on a piece of paper and sign it. It does have to be signed by all people who are on the lease of the unit to be eligible. The landlord um, may still evict for non-payment of rent for other lease violations not related to non-payment of rent. And they may charge late fees, penalties, and interest per their contract with the, with the, per the lease agreement with the tenant. So if you have provisions for that, you may, you may charge those. You may also provide regular notice to the tenant about their, um, undue, their due rent payments and any additional penalties and fees, as long as it is not a notice to vacate or an eviction notice. So, why do realtors care about this? Well, 25% of realtors have rental property. Um, either that's their full-time possession, um, full-time job, or they have uh, their residential salespeople who have a few rental units on the side. Um, but 25% of all realtors have, uh, have rental properties. In addition, there are 40% um, of all rental units are owned by mom and pops. So those are, our, those are our members, right? They're owned by mom and pops. Another 37% are owned by LLCs, which are usually small businesses. So that's a total of 77% of all residential units in this country are owned by small businesses or individuals. So if you look at that in the big picture, most people think, oh, this is big corporations. They can survive not getting this rental income. That's really not the fact of, of rental markets. The other reason why realtors care is because when this eviction moratorium expires on December 31st, there's gonna be an eviction crisis in this country. Renters are going to owe countless amounts of money and due and pass due rent payments along with penalties and fees. And it's gonna turn this housing crisis, this healthcare crisis into a housing crisis. So it's going to affect our economy in huge ways. Real estate has a giant effect on the economy. And so this will affect all real estate markets across the country. So what's the solution? We think the solution is rental assistance. I'm happy to learn that Nevada is using some of their CARES Act money for tenant protection rental assistance. Not all states are doing that. So you're very lucky that, uh, that your governor and your, um, your elected officials are doing that. But I will tell you that it, it, the, the need for rental assistance is going to be great. I will tell you there was legislation that was passed in June, mostly on a partisan basis in the House of Representatives, that was an overall COVID relief package that did include some rental assistance language. But that rental assistance language only applied to people making less than 80% of AMI. And any of you who heard me say that $99,000 is the, is the threshold for this know that that's way more than 80% of AMI in most communities across the country. So this um, moratorium applies to virtually the entire universe. It's 95.7% of all renters make under 99,000 or 198 if you're um, married. 
So legislation that was passed in the House is as a, as a start, but what we are asking for and we are urging Congress to pass a more substantial rental assistance program that will cover everyone covered by the CDC notice that will be delivered directly to property owners because if your tenants are not able to, to make their rent, they may, um, if they receive that money, they may use it for other things. Um, so we want it provided directly to the housing providers to make sure that they're able to make their obligations, like their mortgage, their, in, their insurance, their interest, their, um, and, their, and their maintenance of the property, staff on the property, all of that. So we want it to go directly to um, property owners. We do have a um, call for action, a targeted call for action going on right now where we're asking um, FTCs to contact their member of Congress directly about this need. I'll also tell you, we are working in coalition with our industry partners, the National Association of Home Builders, the Mortgage Bankers, Multi-Housing Council, Apartment Association, Manufactured Housing Institute, you name it. All of our friends in the industry are working together on this. We've sent joint letters to Congress and to the White House. We just ran an ad in Politico, which is an inside the beltway um, publication aimed at lawmakers, urging them to pass rental assistance immediately. And we will continue to look at all of our options. I will say a number of people have asked if this is, um, if there is a legal case to be had here. That's something we are absolutely looking into. We are looking into uh, if this is a takings, if this is um, an illegal administrative action, what other options we have with the court system. And so you'll be hearing more about that. One way that you can help us with this battle is to let us know your stories. So if you are a landlord who has been impacted by this rule, who you already received a declaration by a resident, please let us know. I'm gonna put my email address in the chat. We absolutely wanna hear from you because this helps us make the case with the administration and with uh, Congress. We also have a Facebook group that I encourage you to join. It's NAR Property Management Forum Facebook group. Um, you have to be admit, you have to apply for it. I will just admit you if I see you're from Nevada. Um, so please, um, so please join there and people are telling their stories. We've, we've collected some great stories from there already about how this is impacting small landlords across the country. I know one of the questions um, people are going to be asking is, um, what does this apply to you and how do residents present it to you? Number one, they can present it to you basically however and whenever they want. <laughs> Um, we've had landlords who've been presented to the, this when the sheriff is at the door, trying this happened yesterday, um, ready to actually uh, physically remove the tenants from the property and the tenant whipped it out and the sheriff walked away. So it's really gonna be dependent on what your local how your local jurisdictions are interpreting this. We also had a case um, yesterday where um, the, the landlord was with the tenants in court to get the writ of possession and the judge asked the tenants if they were eligible for this and handed them the form, which they signed, and then the, the judge dismissed it. So um, places are interpreting that there's not a lot of direction in the CDC notice, and so it's being interpreted differently in every jurisdiction. So um, do landlords do not have to proactively provide this notice to their tenants, although I will tell you that the um, Department of Housing and Urban Development HUD yesterday put out a notice urging property owners to provide this to your tent to the tenants, but there, the CDC notice does not include an affirmative requirement that you do that. I will also tell you that the, the enforcement of this rule is very, very strong. So the tenants have to certify under penalty of perjury, but a landlord, if you evicted someone who um, in, in violation of this notice, if you evicted someone who then later got COVID, this notice basically finds you responsible for their death and can, um, fi can find you um, a fine of up to $500,000 and a year in prison if they are evicted and later um, die of COVID. So um, this is a very serious notice. So I encourage you to work with your local attorneys about how it's being interpreted in your area and how you want to, um, and how you want to react to it. Uh, it's, this is, I know there are tenants, you may have tenants who, due to the CARES Act eviction provisions or your own state's eviction provisions, haven't paid since, we have, we've heard of cases where renters haven't paid since January. Um, and they weren't able to be evicted because the CARES Act went into place in March. They started, they got the notice to evict in July. They started the eviction in on August, but didn't actually evict them before September 4th, and now are unable to evict them. So we know the burden this is placing on landlords who have their own responsibilities to meet with these properties. And so um, we are doing everything we can to try and make this workable for our property owners and for, for residents who may be struggling during this time. 
it, it's a it's a challenging order and we're all just going to have to work our best um, to to get to get through it happy to answer any questions it's i know it's a really tough one <laughs> Yes, Megan, thank you so much for that summary of um, a very hard to read and understand document um, from the CDC. And so we appreciate NER's perspective on that. I know you guys have done a lot of research and reviewed it quite a bit. Um, Vonda and I know you have a couple questions that I that, that was proposed uh, earlier uh, prior to this. So I want to give you a few minutes to go ahead and ask those. So I wanna make sure, I, I wanna clarify just a few things that you had mentioned, Megan. Um, number one, the uh, Facebook group page, everybody's been asking, it's the NAR Property Management Forum page. Um, you just join it, you'll authorize everybody here from Nevada. So just wanna make sure everybody knows that. Secondly, um, right after you went into the eligibility requirements for um, what the tenants, you know, how they can become eligible for this, for the declaration, you had said so you had said you can evict for non-payment. I just want to give you a moment to clarify that because there was a lot of, of chat um, in regards to that. Yes, absolutely. So the um, so the order only the order only re only refers to people who are not paying their rent, and that that you have to provide this exception if they certify that they've met all those categories. And I will say. Um, among the five, you know, I mentioned like five things they have to say that their income and that they've been trying to pay their rent and they've had reduced wages. They do also have to self-certify that they understand that they still owe this rent, that this is still their obligation, that they sign this contract. So there are a number of provisions, provisions um, such as that, that they also have to attest to. Um, so it is clear that they still owe the rent. However, if the person is um, violating the lease from, for example, if they are a, um, if they're a danger to the property or others, if they are, um, if they are um, uh, uh, interacting with criminal activity, if they're, if they are partaking of criminal activity on the property, things like that are all things you can still evict them for. If it has, but if, I, I will just say that our experience has been in different courts across the country so far that um, they have been very lenient with, 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 the tenants with respect to this, because the, if the idea is to prevent the spread of COVID, um, these these judges are, are concerned about what the implications will be for that family if they are evicted. So um, it should be something very clear, a very clear violation of the lease that that um, theoretically endangers the property or others in the property. Um, there are a couple other provisions they have in the in the in the in the um, order, but. Um, it's, uh, you're gonna to wanna to have a very clear declaration. The other thing I did wanna point out was that you do not, you are not able to um, ask for proof. If the resident signs this document that they have met these criteria, you cannot ask for proof of such. That's not required under the, under the notice for the tenants. Um, your only recourse there, if you, have, if you have knowledge, actual knowledge that they are um, falsifying the document, you could bring them to court for perjury. But other than that, you cannot ask for any documentation for any part of the declaration. So essentially, you'd have to prove that they were lying on that, that declaration. They, okay. Yes. Um, and one more thing to clarify real quick um, on that, because I know past due rents is one thing, but what about the no cause? What if a tenant is a holdover on a month to month and they have past due rents? I mean, clearly yeah. their lease is not in current term. Yeah, that's a great question. And again, um, you should consult with your local attorneys on that. But our, 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 the attorneys we've been talking to said that that, is, that will be a challenge. That because it's a, a public, under, under the Public Health Act to, to stop the spread of COVID, unless you were planning on taking possession of that property as your own principal residence, um, you're going to have a harder time um, evicting if they're holdover, if they're holdover tenants, or if they're, if they're month to month. Or, or the lease is expiring, it's going to, our, our attorneys are saying it's going to be a, a harder challenge, but it really depends on your, your local lib or TEDA courts. Okay. okay. Thank you. And then I know you, you touched on the CARES Act um, funds being utilized um, specifically here. So I'm just going to do one more clarification question on that. It's, it's our understanding the CARES Act funds uh, must be spent by December 31st of this year. But if the CDC order is in effect until 1231, how does a tenant or a landlord access the funds with the stay on evictions? Can they apply for those funds now? And if so, how? So that is a great question. And um, you got, like I said, you guys are very lucky that your state is is using those funds for that purpose. Not all states are, so that's great that your that your state is prioritizing that. 
Um, I, yes, they do have to be used by the end of the year and it, the, the term runs, um, runs concurrent with the CDC notice, um, but it's gonna be up to your state on how you, um, how you actually apply. So I'm gonna defer that to your treasurer. It's gonna speak after me. And we're just going to speak with uh, Treasurer Conine next. Um, one other quick question. The CDC uh, moratorium, is that for residential and commercial or just residential? Oh, great question. It only applies to residential. So this does not apply to, to any commercial properties, only residential housing. Single family resident, multifamily resident, garden style, any type of residential housing, but only residential. Okay, fabulous. Great question. And then well, we didn't, do we sorry, have more questions? Um, so I was going to, you would, we'd mentioned that there were five exceptions for the CDC moratorium. Uh, can you hit on those for us? Can you clarify those if you don't, wouldn't mind? Yeah, let me just, I'm going to find the actual language so I don't say it wrong. I know it's criminal activity, danger to property, danger to, um, danger to resident. And I did hear that, um, I did see in the question, somebody asked, well, if they are, if we're not allowed to enter the property, how do we know if they're damaging the unit? That is a really good question. And, and um, my answer to that is um, consult with your attorney. I'm not an attorney, by the way. Um, but more importantly, um, I would say that you're, you can't prove that, you can't prove they are. So if you can't prove they are, this is gonna be a tough call for you. So uh, I would not use that unless they have, um, unless, unless you actually know that they have, um, that you have, have knowledge that they've damaged the property and that there are damage to other um, residents. Um, okay, sorry, I'm trying to find the actual language on the, um, on how you can, on what you can still evict for. Um, okay, here it is. Uh, engaging in criminal activity, threatening the health or safety of other residents, damaging or posing an immediate or significant risk of damage to property, violating any applicable building code, health ordinance, or similar regulation relating to health and safety, or violating any other contractual obligation other than the timely payment of rent or similar housing related payment, including non-payment of late penalties, fees, penalties, or interest. So that's pretty wide open, right? Violating any other contractual obligation. I'm just gonna tell you that that has not been our, the experience so far, um, that that's, that's been, it's just been challenging. It's been challenging to evict for, if it's not one of the other ones, like criminal activity or, or safety. But the, but the CDC order is wide open on that. Somebody just put in there, what if they have a pet and they're not supposed to have a pet? You could certainly argue that's damage to the unit, right? So if, you, if somebody has a pet in there and they're not allowed to have a pet, well, now you, that's going to be a more difficult unit to rent to someone, the next, you, the next tenant, if they have allergies, for example. So you could, I think you could certainly make an argument that that's damage to the unit. And what about HOA violations? So... I think it depends on, I, I think it depends on the sort of the severity of it. So if it's like, let's say it's a noise ordinance or something, I think if there, um, if it's repeated behavior, I think you could certainly give it a shot. Right. We can always give everything a shot. I mean, honestly, every time we reach out to a judge or whether it's local or national, everybody is going to interpret this, this as they see that they feel it should be interpreted. So it's going to be different from everybody that, that we get in front of. Um, but we have to have our ducks in a row. We have to have proof if we're going to challenge for perjury. We, I mean, $500,000 and um, all the other fines that could go along with it, the CDC is serious. So we want to be very, very careful how we are interpreting and acting and going forward. Just to put things in perspective, in Southern Nevada, 16% uh, of all single family residences have tenant, tenants in them, 35% of condos and 24% of, con of, of um, townhouses. So we have a tremendous amount of tenants in our housing stock here. And so we want to make sure that we are uh, departing proper information, that we're treading very lightly, um, but that we are also doing a good job of representing our clients, which are the landlords, um, and being fair to the tenants as well. So uh, again, Megan, we, we really appreciate you advocating for us and um, getting on here. I know your schedule is jam-packed, and we were joking earlier that I mean, 20,000 emails a day is probably a minimum of, of the questions that you're getting. Um, so we, we appreciate you taking time out and, and educating educating the, the Nevada uh, property managers here and, and advocating for us as well. So we continue to look forward to working with you and, and keeping in close contact. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Awesome. All right. I think our next guest is ready for us. Um, we have State Treasurer Zach Conine um, on the panel. So welcome, uh, Treasurer Conine. First of all, I want to thank you on behalf of the PAG for appearing multiple times. Uh, the last time I think we were at 
50 appearances you had had so far, and that was a couple, you know, maybe a month ago, so you're probably at over 100 appearances for everybody. So everybody appreciates you uh, coming on all the time um, in regarding the eviction series and the property managers and how we can understand tenant relief programs. Last we met, you were um, talking about the how to apply for the tenant relief programs, and they were very, very new at that time. Um, so we appreciate your time and always enlightening us, and, and it's very, very helpful. And if you could please give us an update on where things have started and where they've gone and where we're at today, uh, we'd appreciate that, that version. With that said, Treasurer Conine. Well, thanks again so much for having me. Thanks for the work you're doing to keep your members uh, informed. Uh, I think it's a really important time uh, now to be sharing as much information as we can. And, and thanks to all the realtors who've been working with your tenants to try and find solutions to keep people in their homes. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm Zach Conine, I'm your state treasurer. Uh, the treasurer doesn't usually have too much to do with housing, but uh, in the case of the crisis, everybody leans in and grabs an oar and tries to get to shore. So that's why I'm here. Uh, now the state received about $836 million worth of coronavirus relief fund, uh, which was part of Title V of the CARES Act, which was that big uh, bill that everyone's been speaking about that brought in money for all sorts of things, uh, unemployment assistance, uh, FEMA, testing, tracing, et cetera, et cetera. But part of it was uh, the CARES Act. And uh, to the previous speaker's point, we were able to take some of that and put it into residential rental assistance. We also had a commercial rental assistance program uh, that looks like it's going to be able to help something like 15 or 1600 small businesses here. And we've got some future commercial programs um, that certainly some of your members could be interested in. And we'll share those details uh, when they're finalized. But the commercial program started off with $50 million dollars. Um, or excuse me, the, the rental assistance program started off with $50 million, of which 30 went to residential. Now let's talk county by county. So Clark County received $20 million from the state. They also received $30 million of money that Clark County received directly from CRF that went to that program for a total of 50. Uh, Reno received $5 million from the state and also received $2 million from the city of Sparks for their residents and $1.5 million from the city of Reno for their residents. And um, the rural communities, which is the other uh, 15 counties and Carson City in the state received uh, $5 million. So of that money, about 6 million of it is in the hands of landlords right now. About 40 million of it is allocated or in the queue. Now there's an additional $10 million uh, that the governor allocated uh, during when he put out his most recent eviction uh, moratorium, which was right before the CDC moratorium, which obviously extended it through the end of the year, and, and that frankly was a surprise to everybody. Um, but that uh, additional $10 million is originally going to backstop the eviction mediation program that the courts are putting together, and we'll move those funds around as necessary. Now, applications are currently open in all three counties. They're open in uh, the rural counties, they never closed, opened in Reno, they never closed, and in Clark, they shut down for a little bit, and some of the uh, partners are now taking in new applications. Now, in Clark and in all the counties, one of the things we realized was that the process simply is taking too long. It's taking too long for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we're confirming a lot of the information. That was a piece of feedback we got uh, from the realtors and other groups wanted to make sure that this money was going to the tenants who needed it, right? So we're confirming income levels, we're confirming uh, assets on hand, we're confirming that the lease is active, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that they fall under the AMI uh, level, which is 120%. And uh, just to kind of ballpark that for everybody, that means about $70,000 in Clark County is sort of the, the top end of where you can apply for these funds if you're living by yourself. And so as we went through that process, we realized it was taking a long time for people to give back uh, the information to us, sometimes weeks. Um, and the other piece was it, the landlords are taking a lot of time to get back their piece of information, right? That's taking two or three or four weeks. And because the payments go in this program directly to the landlords, which I think we all agree is the most effective way to get it done, is really slowing down the process. So we're trying to speed that up um, by switching some of the confirmations into affirmations. So again, just like the, the CDC guidance, people saying, I have this problem and I fall under these criteria, and then being subject to penalties and audits uh, as necessary to try and obviously uh, prevent fraud. But we know because the landlords are involved, we're a little less worried about fraud than something that's just a single point of contact. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing we're doing is we're putting together a centralized portal in Clark uh, because Clark is working through 14 different 
uh, community partners, some of which got bombarded and sort of immediately had their queue full. We had more than 40,000 uh, inquiries into the program in the first uh, about three weeks, like 24 days. Um, and so that obviously then created that backlog. So what we're trying to do is get through that backlog and at the same time, make sure the eviction mediation program, which was passed uh, or the, the enabling legislation was passed during the first special session. Um, I'm sorry, second special session? It all kind of runs together. Time is a flat surf circle, we're in a pandemic, deep apologies. Anyway, one of the special sessions, uh, and someone's gonna nod and tell me which one it is, but we'll go back to it, really doesn't matter. Um, one of the special sessions uh, had some enabling language for an eviction mediation process. One of the pieces of feedback we got from landlords, um, justices of the peace, et cetera, is that we needed funds available for the eviction mediation to be effective, right? There needed to be something to mediate over. Um, so we're gonna make sure that there's a direct pipeline into that program. Um, so that's a, a general uh, overview. Uh, we don't believe there's additional funds at the state level currently, which is why we, uh, as well as uh, basically, I'm sure everybody else on the call who's doing this professionally at the national level, they're advocating for additional relief dollars. Uh, most of your delegation uh, in the state of Nevada is in favor of that, uh, but obviously the holdup is on the Senate side. So we're trying to push nationally to try and get um, the Senate onto the same page and figure out a solution so that landlords can get paid uh, and that people can stay in their homes. So happy to take any questions about literally anything, uh, but I'll turn it back over to you all. Well, thank you so much, Treasurer Conan. You answered quite a few of our questions, so I appreciate that. Um, there are definitely a few more that we do have, so um, thanks for taking those on. Um, first of all, there, the $10 million that the governor announced on August 31st, can you tell us when and where those funds uh, will be allocated? Will it be commercial? Will it be residential? Northern, Southern Nevada, does that matter? And how do tenants actually go and apply for those funds? Yeah, it'll be residential. Uh, it'll likely be through the same programs that already exist uh, with the addiction of potentially some of the mediation programs. Could be another pipeline. Um, purpose for that is obviously if someone is in mediation, it means that the landlord and the tenant have already talked. They haven't been able to reach agreement um, so that we think there's a, a deeper opportunity to do that. Um, I see one question coming in. And, oh, and sorry, from a geographic standpoint, it's going to go where the need is, right? So majority of the need is in Clark County. I would expect a majority of that money will go to Clark County, right? 74.6% of our population, give or take. Um, so 74.6% of the problem, give or take. Um, but, you know, we will uh, we'll adjust it based on where the monies are. Now, there's a question about, you know, can those funds go directly to landlords without the tenant applying? That's a difficult one for us. Under the CARES Act, uh, there's a responsibility that CRF funds um, go to individuals directly impacted by COVID-19, right? Either for response recovery or something else. And so we have to have a stipulation that says, I am impacted by COVID-19. A landlord not paying, not being paid rent could be because of COVID-19, but it could also be because their tenant uh, isn't paying rent for one of a series of reasons. So we need that attestation from, um, from the tenant currently. We're trying to figure out ways around that, looking at what other states are doing to allow that money to go to the landlord without the tenant being involved. Uh, but as of right now, it's a, it's a, it's a piece of the treasury guidance. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way to avoid it. Uh, we have gotten that question a fair amount of times, so happy to answer that one. If you can figure that out, I think that the entire state will be extremely appreciative because that seems to be one of the concerns that we've had from the get-go is why aren't landlords able to apply for these reliefs if the tenant is just not willing to. Um, yeah, and, and I will say we haven't, we've heard that, but we haven't actually talked to a tenant who hasn't been willing to. So I guess if you can't contact the tenant, I could see that, that being a problem. Um, but I, with a lot of times, I would certainly encourage uh, all landlords to talk to their tenants. They might not know uh, of the different things that are available to them, right? I mean, we're, we're constantly surprised. Uh, we try to do, as Molly mentioned, a uh, billion and six webinars, but there's always people who don't know about these programs. Mm -hmm. It's the nature of the beast. So sharing information with your tenant could be a good way. Uh, but I know that sometimes tenants, just like sometimes landlords go dark and, and there isn't any information from them. Um, we've, got, but, we've got 400 property managers on the call today that can surely help you find tenants that don't that don't want to fly. Um, I've got two uh, names myself yeah. <laughs> that I can send you. There you go. Yeah, and I'm not, and I guess I don't know why, right? Um, other than perhaps just not because, wanting to. Well, the biggest concern we have is between the CDC and the governor's directive and just the misinformation to the public, which is I can't be evicted, so I don't have to do anything. Um, and it's very hard for us to, to depart the proper 
knowledge to the tenants that says, no, you can be evicted and there are things you can do to prevent that. Um, you know, but they just hear that they can't be evicted, so they don't want to act. And that is frustrating. The other thing that is, that is frustrating right now, and, and hopefully we're going to have some type of, of an answer in regards to that $10 million. I mean, Southern Nevada was shut off pretty quickly um, from, the, from the rental assistance pipeline um, because that just got eaten up so quickly, right? There is a dramatic need here for those dollars. And I don't know if $10 million is going to be enough. I mean, I know it's not going to be enough. We all know that. Yeah. Um, so is that, is that going to be opened back up at some time in the near term um, so that we can allow those tenants that in, in inform them that they do want to make application because they do want to stay in their property and try and get as much assistance as possible, knowing that they know the, owe those dollars at some point in time? Do we know when that's going to open back up? Yeah, so it's open right now. They're taking applications right now through some of the partners. Uh, HelpHopeHome.org uh, is available. I'm not sure if it's updated on the state's general website, but help hopehome.org. I'm looking at it right now. Um, they're taking applications right now in Clark. Uh, one of the big questions was we got a number of people who applied to multiple programs at the same right. time. And while there is a centralized system um, that confirms that we don't send money out to multiple people, there isn't a centralized system from an inquiry perspective. So at some point, everybody runs through a check filter to make sure they're not, say, double dipping into the program. Um, but from an inquiry perspective, that it doesn't exist. So uh, one of the, the the mechanics was getting everybody through far enough that we could start deduping that list and understand if there are funds available. We believe there are still funds available in Clark, uh, but again, it's going to be first come first serve. So the more people apply, but how do they know where to go for that first serve? So there's 14 different entities, right? I had a particular tenant apply for these dollars. They got an email back saying you are 30. There's 3,200 people in front of you. We don't know if or when we'll get to you. And by the way, try these other 13 agencies. Yep. Um, so that, that is, that is a process that is arduous and frustrating for tenants. Another reason why tenants don't want to apply. They're like, why well, I don't want to work that hard. Um, so what, is there a better, is there one or two open right now? Are all 14 open right now? There are, by my count, there's seven open right now. Uh, I believe four of them are actively taking applications, but again, I, I encourage people to reach out to help hopehome.org and get that information. And, and Molly, I'll be honest, this is going to be a frustrating process, right? Yeah. We have. $50 million, the whole is somewhere in the couple of hundred million dollar range. Congress needs to act to get more money into states to pay for things like this, period. The state does not have the funds. And trust me, I see the bank account. Um, and so, you know, encouraging congressional action is gonna be important here because um, otherwise I don't know that there's a better solution. A Couple of other questions that have come in that I can uh, happy to answer. Uh, if the tenant is uncooperative, we have a landlord who is screwed? Currently, yeah. Um, there are some other programs that you could be available for if you have a business um, that manages your properties. You can probably apply for one or more of the state aid uh, programs, right? Uh, either the CRAG program, which just ended, the next program that's going to come out of GoEd, programs that are available currently right now in Clark County um, and in some of the other counties. I encourage folks to look at those. Um, we could. I see uh, Juana. Uh, hi, Juana. Uh, there's a question about some tenants are not eligible because they owe the government money, bankruptcy, etc. Uh, only folks who have an active tax lien are going to run into trouble there. Um, and yes, they're going to run into trouble there. I don't have a, a better uh, answer than that. Um, and I thought I, I saw got one for you. I apologize. Yeah, please. Um, so we do have uh, all of these places that people can apply where tenants can apply for assistance, but you have, from what you had stated, $40 million in queue, essentially waiting for information, including income, so on and so forth. Um, what's the expected time frame for that backlog to, you know, to get that money? Because that's a lot of money that, that I think would be some serious relief for landlords that could lessen this blow. Yeah, agreed. So we're working on ways to speed that process up, which gets into some of the process things we're dealing with early. On the same side, we have to make sure that we're falling into the guidance offered by the treasury because if you don't fall into the guidance offered by the treasury we have to pay the money back and the state doesn't have that money no state has that money that's not a nevada specific problem so making sure that you fall on the right side of the federal guidance is the only way to proceed unfortunately it's a bit of an arduous process and i'm hopeful that you know uh, all the things we're doing will speed it up um, certainly all the money will be out by the end of the year because that's the timeline when it needs to be out by okay um, I mean, we do have a couple questions. Molly, did you want to run through some of these? Sure. Um, so, and they're they're popping the, the chat pretty pretty quickly here in regards to that. Um, so the so the, the the applications are now open, and if we go on to help hope 
clarkhome.org. We'll figure that out. Um, one of the, the sorry for Clark County. Everybody else go to housing.nv.gov. It's either the Reno Housing Authority or the Rural Housing Authority who would take that application, depending on whether or not you're in Washoe County or anywhere else. Okay, super. Um, and it, that 10 million you said was allocated um, per rata by population, more more or less. Um, but those dollars are gonna. So I'm, I'm sorry, just to confirm, it hasn't yet. That okay. is where we think it'll happen, but we've got to get through that backlog. The the that ten million dollars is not holding up anyone from getting aid. The the problem right now, the time frame issue, is landlords and tenants being responsive to those emails and getting it back. And it is a landlord and tenant thing. Landlord needs to follow up with the tenant. Tenant needs to follow up with the landlord because we need information from both to stay within treasury guidance. And so, what about the people that are already? being validated and, and that information going through. I mean, will they get in line first for the 10 million? Well, yeah, the, think about the 10 million is just 10 million more. It's not a separate 10 million. It's not existing in a separate pot. We might end up using it for eviction mediation if those dollars go out first, depending on how the eviction mediation process goes out. But it's not like there's a $50 million pot and a $10 million pot. There's a $60 million pot as it relates to, to or $60 million pot from the state. And then obviously the Clark and Sparks and the rest of the money. That's tremendously light. So is there any um, discussion on future dollars? Is there any discussion on what that looks like going forward? Yeah, I, I think everyone agrees that we need more money. There isn't any more money. There just isn't any more, um, right? We've, we got a certain amount from the state, from the federal government. That money went to all sorts of different programs, but primarily to contact testing and tracing and education and distance learning and yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, we need a couple of hundred million dollars more, we expect, in rental assistance, which is, again, why we need federal support. So everybody should be pounding on it. It's less effective here, right, because your delegation supports it. Um, but this thing is held up in, in the Senate, specifically. The Senate proposal does not include, um, and it's not a partisan thing, but functionally right now it is, Senate proposal does not include money coming in for rental assistance. Does not. So if that's what passes. There is no more money for these programs. And that's going to be a tough, a tough message for, um, for the landlords that are trying to figure out how do they uh, do the right thing by the tenants by keeping them in the property and also be able to pay all their back mortgages as well and all the different things. So that's, it's oh. tough. Uh, one of the questions that was just asked is can property managers apply? And no, I, I mean, the tenant has property. to make that application. Yeah, the, the property manager can do uh, the paperwork piece for the landlord. It doesn't have to be the landlord themselves, right? So if the landlord's somewhere else, property manager can take care of the landlord's piece, um, but it does have to be the tenant applying under treasury guidance. Um, I think one other piece that's important here is there are plenty of mortgage relief options available for landlords that have single family homes. Um, it's not everybody, but 85% of Nevada single family homes, of which plenty are rented, uh, are covered by the government service entities, the Fannie uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, forbearance until the end of the year. Uh, most major banks are working with their tenants to either do a, an add-on loan or push the months to the end of the mortgage. Again, none of those are ideal situations, but this isn't an ideal situation. Um, but those options are available for a majority of single-family um, borrowers. And so to the extent that someone is having a problem, I guess that's the other piece from an aid perspective, someone's having a problem getting their bank to agree to forbearance or something else, give us a call. Um, cause we've talked to, I don't know, probably two banks for every, uh, webinar I've been on. So quite a few. And that represents about 50% of the housing stock though, right? Fannie Freddie government backed is about 15, 50%. 85.4, 85. I think it might be 85.5. In of all loans. Correct. Okay. Vonda, I know you had, you had your hand up, so ask away. I do. I have one question and this will probably be my last, um, is in regards to qualification for, cause you had said that the. The ones that are in queue, you're still confirming info. Do you have like an eligibility requirement that's like you can tell the um, property managers what they are so we can, you know, talk to the tenants about it and, and maybe get them to or encourage them to apply? Yeah, all the eligibility information is on either helphopehome.org if you're in Clark County, housing.nv.gov uh, if you're not. The eligibility for the three programs is about the same, but of course, AMI is based on uh, your local area. So the Washoe AMI is different than, say, the Clark AMI, right? Um, but the general criteria involve uh, being under an AMI of 120%, being able to show some impact from COVID, and that's effectively an attestation, having less than $3,000 in income, not already being on another 
uh, government sponsored uh, programs so like housing vouchers, right? Because they don't, they can't overlap. Uh, and a few other minor criteria. One of the questions was, do you have to be a legal US resident? You don't. Um, so, you know, again, most Nevadans, a wide variety of, uh, wide grouping of Nevadans should be able to apply uh, for this program. Definitely got to tell them about it, have to encourage them. Um, and then we as a state will continue looking uh, for additional federal support so that we can help more landlords. You know, I think that this program was originally set up to help landlords um, and to keep people in their homes. And you know, I think it's doing that. I think it's doing it a little more slowly than we'd like, uh, but that's why it's there. Thank you. And we've got a couple questions that from the previous, and if you guys haven't um, had a chance to view the previous webinars that, that we've done, this is number five, so there's four previous ones. It's on NVR's uh, YouTube channel. Please jump on those and, and look at those. But uh, Treasurer Conine, there's a couple questions regarding, you know, do the, does the tenant have to have no savings? What if they're on, what if they get unemployment? Does that count? You had touched on that on your previous webinar. Do you want to run through the qualifications just real quick or let people know where they can find those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, qualifications, again, are on helphopehome.org uh, or um, housing.nv.gov. Sorry. Um, but yes, H, uh, UI income will count towards the AMI. However, UI income, even with that additional $600 uh, FPUC, the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation match uh, from earlier on when that was going, that still is under the line um, for one person. Now, if you had three people in the same home, um, receiving UI at the same time, then it, you'd probably be over that AMI line. Um, so that does count. Uh, and then what was the other question? I'm so sorry. Do they have to have assets? No, save, what if they have savings? Yeah, less than $3,000 in liquid assets. And, and there's a definition of what liquid assets are, but they're kind of what you think they would. If you've got $3,000 of cash in the bank, um, you should, or take is that the money needs to go to individuals who don't have um, those assets first. Um, and that, that frankly, was a policy decision. What's that? You should pay your landlord with it if you've got more than 3000 in there. Right. Um, and then a uh, question coming in, forbearance is stigmatizing owners' ability to borrow, refinance, and obtain financing to relocate uh, three or four months post forbearance. Not a good solution. Jeanette, I, that might be the case with your bank. That's not a case with all the major banks that have made commitments to the state of Nevada to not do that. So if you're having trouble with your bank, please let me know. We'll give them a call together. Um, and I can tell you all of the majors uh, are avoiding that problem specifically because of what happened to them economically during the last recession. Um, the other question I have in regards to forbearance, uh, Treasurer Conine, is so in the beginning of this, again, nobody could have predicted six months plus what's going to happen going forward. We still don't know. We thought we had it figured out. And then the CDC has their uh, guidelines or their uh, order and, and Governor Sislak extended his. So it's, it's a constantly moving piece. Um, but we're coming up, the December 31st date is a date, but then we've got to then move to, if, if we are gonna have evictions and people are gonna um, get possession back of their property, however they're going to act, um, that could be pushed out because of possible mediations or just the court system being bogged down. We're gonna come up to that six plus six month. We're gonna come up to that year pretty quickly in March. Um, for the forbearance. Is there any talk with the banks uh, allowing additional forbearance? Because we could still be in a situation where they're not able to collect rents uh, by the time they either get possession back and have to re-rent their properties and have any cash flow come back in again. Yeah, I think there's kind of two answers here, right? One is the, the policy answer and one is the economic answer. From an economic perspective, for a ma majority of banks, they don't want the inventory. They don't want the inventory back in. They don't want to deal with what they had to deal with during the last financial crisis. It decimated uh, some of their long-term prospects really hurt banks, right? From just a pure economic perspective. Um, it also hurt banks from a policy perspective. They, they, banks were the quote unquote villains of the last financial crisis. And I think everyone is deeply trying not to be the villains of this financial crisis, right? Uh, which is why we definitely encourage everyone to talk to everyone else and, and try to find solutions here that work. It's a hard time for everybody. Um, I, you know, I'd also point out that the GSE timeline for expanding forbearance has moved three or four times, and I expect will continue to move if uh, the pandemic continues to be a problem. I don't, I don't think anyone has a crystal ball as to a this will end on X date, which is why you keep seeing deadlines move, because um, people are taking their best guesses and moving. And from a policy perspective, obviously the highest and best uh, from a health uh, standpoint is keeping people in their homes. And so that's why the GSE is continuing to move out mortgages. That's why the CDC did what they did, um, because the, the prospect of individuals not being in their homes um, is a public health crisis. 
It is. So we're hoping to keep it to just the health crisis and not a financial crisis. Um, so it's it's great that you are constantly asking and, 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 and available to work with us. So I think what we've all heard today is um, that Treasury Conan is very available to work with banks that are not uh, playing nice in the sandbox. And so if you are having challenges, um, he, you heard the offer. I mean, we may flood him, um, but let's flood him and uh, protect the, the, the owner's rights and the landlord's rights and, and keep those tenants moving forward as well. So we appreciate that. Um, any other questions that we haven't answered again, we're going to continue to manage and look at that chat and we'll push out the answers to those questions. Any last minute uh, comments, Treasurer Conine? No, but just again, Jeanette, I see your comment about forbearance. Please feel free to reach out to our office. We'll call them together. Uh, a lot of times also with banks and, and this is just the nature of banking, you've got the folks in the call center uh, who maybe have the last piece of information, and then you got the folks upstairs who have the most recent piece of information. A number of times we've called mortgage servicers and bankers, and literally the message just hadn't made its way down to the floor yet. Uh, but I think that open line of communication is important for everybody. So just please, please, please talk to your landlords. Uh, we know this is a tough time. I know it's a tough time. Governor knows it's a tough time uh, for everybody. And so we're trying to come up with solutions that help as many people as possible in the most effective way possible uh, while still not running into any of the federal uh, confusion. But hopefully we can get some additional federal support, additional money into the states. So we can put additional money into the rental assistance program so that that money can go into your pocket so you can make your mortgage payments, keep your small businesses afloat and the rest. That's, that's what we're focused on. Excellent. Well, we appreciate that. I'm so sorry. I know I, I said that I had one last question for you, but I have one last, last question for you. Yeah. Um, did, so uh, we want to just clarify on the, uh, the funds. Does that money have to be spent by December 31st? That's a great question and one that me and 49 other treasurers, well, 48 in New York as a comptroller, have also asked. And so the, uh, under the guidance, money's supposed to be out the door, but then future guidance said that, well, if money was committed, like let's say you bought something, but it was net 30 and you bought it on December 15th and you weren't going to pay it till January 15th, that's probably okay. Um, we expect that that date is going to move, uh, but until it does, all of the money is expected. It needs to be out the door um, and to kind of its final destination by that time. So you couldn't just say put $50 million or $10 million into this program and say, well, eventually it'll get out there. It needs to be in the hands of landlords or tenants or small businesses or food banks or whatever um, by December 30th under the current coronavirus guidelines. CRF guidelines, excuse me. You guys have a lot of work ahead of you. <laughs> no, it's uh, <laughs> webinars are the breaks. Yeah. That's right. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> thanks so much. All right, we're going to let you go spend that money. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. If anybody needs us, don't hesitate to reach out to our office. Ask at nevadatreasurer.gov, ASK at nevadatreasurer.gov. We'll get back to you as soon as possible, all right? Thanks for all you're doing. Thanks for taking care of your tenants. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, who's overwhelmed? Whew. I am. I so, like paper after paper of notes. Yes. So, and, and, and we meet on a regular basis and we're still overwhelmed. So, we appreciate everybody sticking on. We've got our next guest coming up. Um, let's take a moment here to return to the CDC order, which I know uh, Megan Booth did a great job explaining it, but I know we have additional questions. Um, but we also want to know really how does that relate? to our practices of evictions in Nevada. Um, remember that the chat function is open, which you guys have not forgotten and not disappointed, so thank you. Um, our next guest is Chief Deputy Attorney General Mark Kruger, who has been with us several times before, and so thank you on behalf of the PAG and all attendees, um, as well as we wanna thank Attorney General Ford and everyone within his office for all the cooperation we've seen from the Attorney General's office during this pandemic. Um, and we've worked very, very closely with uh, the AG's office, and it's been uh, very productive. So thank you. We hosted the AG um, Attorney General on a webinar a couple weeks ago, uh, just before the CDC order came out, though. So um, again, things are moving quickly, and um, things have changed since then. Um, and a lot has changed, obviously, as we know. And we know the Office of the Attorney General has some guidance for us on the interplay between the CDC order and the governor's recent directive extending non-payment of evictions. Um, so with that said, um, Deputy Attorney General Mark Kruger, uh, he's here to speak to us and to offer us some updates as well as take our questions. Welcome. 
Thank you, um, and, and thanks for everyone for having me on here and, and everyone's comments prior to me. I, I think everybody kind of covered most of, of what uh, I could present. Um, obviously, my focus is on enforcement of Directive 031, which is in place at this time, and um, we, di we do know uh, covers uh, a rental eviction moratorium um, until the end of the day um, on October 14th, 2020, in which case, um, unless something else happens, uh, the CDC order would clearly um, be in place. Now, the question becomes is whether or not the CDC order is in place at this time. Um, since uh, Nevada has Directive 031 and there's language specific to um, the applicability of the CDC order in the CDC's order. Um, and, and that question really isn't one for me to answer. I, I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> but it, it really comes down to um, whether or not courts will enforce that CDC order um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we know that after October 15th, absent something else, um, it will definitely be in place. But whether it is now or it's not um, is really up for the courts to decide. Um, and we do know that uh, Directive 031 is in place and we have the authority to enforce that. Now, with that said, I would submit that, um, I, and I'd like to point out that the CDC order um, requires a tenant, as, as was said earlier, to affirmatively fill out a declaration and deliver it to the landlord. Now, when they de deliver it to the landlord, as you, was also said earlier, is up in the air. It can be any time. It can be right during court, et cetera. But it must be completed by every uh, tenant that's on the lease, um, and it must be delivered to the landlord. The Directive 031 is more restrictive in that it doesn't require the tenants to actually have to do something in order for 031 to be applicable. 031 is absolute in its applicability and um, restricts ev evictions essentially based on a seven day notice uh, or you know, pay or quit notice. So non-payment of rent, which is consistent with what the CDC's order is. So. Um, I, I think that's really the major thing. The only other one I, I saw a question about this earlier and I thought I was, should hit on it is that neither the CDC order nor Directive 031 uh, restrict the imposition of late fees or penalties. Um, however, I, I do want to note that even though Directives 025 and 008 are no longer in effect, during the time that they were in effect, the late fees and penalties were not allowed to be imposed. So there is no retroactive going back to impose those late fees that might have been proved that couldn't be imposed while those orders were in place. Um, and other than that, going forward, uh, Directive 031 um, permits late fees as they're incurred. Uh, to as of September 1st, moving forward. Correct, as of September 1st, thank you. So with that, um, I, I think I'll keep it simple and just answer questions that might be more, more productive uh, use here of our, our few more minutes. Yeah, we, we appreciate that. Um, so from what I've heard, you just state is until October 14th at midnight, the governor's 031 directive is more restrictive than CDC, so it will apply, correct? We'll see, I'm, I'm an attorney, so I have to give you that classical attorney answer, it depends, <laughs> right? Um, when you say more restrictive, I'm saying more restrictive in that it doesn't have an affirmative duty upon a tenant to complete a declaration and deliver it. Whether or not other aspects of the CDC order are more restrictive or less restrictive is up to a court to decide on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, depending on the, the eviction that's, that's occurring, the facts of that eviction, um, the lease, et cetera. And the court would interpret that. Okay. We, we overcomplicate things, but, but essentially you're correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the long but short answer, I think. Right. right. Uh, <laughs> Molly, I'll jump, I'll jump in here um, just, to, just to expand on um, what Chief Deputy Kruger is saying. So the point is, is that there's those five exceptions um, in the CDC order. Now it may be argued that um, non-payment of rent is not the only thing that is covered. And so that's where he's going with this is that it's really going to be a case by case basis in front of each individual judge on which order applies and and how. And so we really have to look at those five exceptions to see what may be argued as far as other things outside the non-payment of rent. 
Thank you for clarifying that. Um, can I jump in here? I have Please. a few questions that are a little bit more, I think, standard for property managers on, on what to do now. Um, can't, so I, I know that we can give tenants 30 day notice if their lease is expired. Is that, can you confirm that? I can definitely confirm that under directive 031. Um, that only covers the seven day notice for pay or quit. So your 30 day notice for unlawful detainer um, would, would be allowable and permissible. Okay, and then can tenants be forced to sign a new lease once their lease is expired during this time with, an, you know, that's a little bit extra than what they're, or a, a raise of rent at this well, time? A lease is a contract essentially, right? So you really can't force anyone into a contract. It has to be a meeting of the mind. So um, there's no way to force a tenant to sign a contract. Now, if a tenant wants to sign one, they certainly can. There's no prohibition against it. Well, they can sign it or they can risk being uh, served a 30 day notice because their lease is coming up. Is that what you're asking, Vandana? Yes. Yes. So one of the two things has to happen. The other, okay. And Enter then a new lease or, or have a 30 day notice. Yep. And then what about um, a roommate situation where the roommate, for instance, isn't on the lease, but they're living in the property? How does, how do you, can they be evicted? Can you remove them from the property? Well, you know, again, you'll, ha you'll have to get specific advice from your specific attorney or legal counsel because I can't give you legal advice on, on a, especially on a blanket um, question. You have to look at the facts of each and every question. I, I can say that Directive 031 doesn't prohibit evictions for other things that are not non-payment of rent. So what we would traditionally call four cause evictions, right? Because even though that's kind of a legal term of art, it's an unlawful detainer because of a nuisance, because of criminal activity, because um, of a breach of some other lease condition. Um, and if that lease contained a provision that said, you are not to have somebody else in the property living there that's not on the lease, then that could arguably be a breach of that lease condition and therefore allow uh, a landlord to move forward with an unlawful detainer eviction, right? So it, it really does depend and I would encourage everyone to seek guidance from their legal counsel um, regarding that. And okay. I'll jump in with that one. So, you know, it's something we've discussed in these last webinars is, you know, there's a difference between the couch surfing uh, person that is coming here and there, and that person is not considered a tenant. Um, and the ones that are tenants that are on the lease, so you guys really have to review your leases, look, make sure that you understand what they say for this exact reason, if you are gonna use these other five day notices, you know what's been breached and it's a clear argument to a judge. Um, I know what they've been seeing a lot of is nuisances where it's like, oh, it's a nuisance, but then you go to court and you really haven't um, met the statutory requirements of a nuisance. So really like best recommendation, look at your leases, know what they say. And if you're gonna make an argument for something other, than, um, than what we've, we've said, then make sure that um, you know what the violation is and it's clear to the judge. Yeah, the judges aren't gonna play nice if we're trying to just bring any nuisance to them. So we've gotta be crystal clear. And there's a bunch of questions in the chat regarding, and there is a lot of confusion regarding uh, Directive 031 and no cause as uh, Chief Deputy um, um, Mark Kruger just mentioned. I mean, cause, no cause. So these are not the same actions. If a tenant is holdover and their lease is expired and they do not want to enter into a new lease or they're on month to month, it doesn't matter if they have back rent or not. You can still move for a 30 day. Um, and, but you can't at the same time go for back rents. It's two different actions, right? And most likely that back, those back rents are gonna be something you fight out in small claims court. Um, so if the, if the owner is looking for possession of the property and they wanna take possession of the property back, that is something that's going to happen separately um, and doesn't have anything to do with back rents if their lease term is up, their holdover, or um, they're on month to month. But again, the judges could look at that differently or the CDC guidelines can be interpreted differently by the judges. And so we just won't know until you get in front of them, but those situations are completely different. So as of September 1st, um, 
late fees can be charged and we can evict if we have no cause evictions. Um, but if, it's, if they're just simply behind in rent and their current lease term is in effect, in essence, it means, let's say their lease doesn't expire till January, you cannot go for an eviction because of back rent. That cannot be the cause um, for um, either a 30 day or, or any type of other action. Does that clarify that, I hope? Um, no, from that regard, no, Tiffany, anything to add? No, and that's exactly correct, Molly. Okay. What's one of the number one complaints that you see coming into your office? Um, it, it's, it's moved, it's changed over time, right? Um, currently, right now, we have an, a misunderstanding, uh, I think, out there in the general community about um, this holdover situation and the fact that there is a continuation of the eviction moratorium only for non-payment of rent. And that there seems to be some confusion um, that the, the, a lot of tenants think that the eviction moratorium is blanket and it covers anything and it doesn't matter. You could be doing criminal activity, anything like that. And you can't be evicted. So it, it's generally trying to educate everyone that um, exactly what the moratorium says um, or interpret it uh, so that they can understand it. Um, there is also some confusion about the CDC's order, but I haven't gotten a lot of questions about that yet. Yet. <laughs> Until October 15th. Correct. <laughs> yeah, we did get the guidance for landlords and tenants and whatnot, and that I think is extremely helpful. So if you haven't received that, I think I just want to make it make it uh, known that we do have those available to you. They were delivered through the local association as well as the state association. So be on the lookout. Um, maybe we can get that out again one more time to our membership, which Agreed. I think is helpful. Good point. Good point, Vonda, that's super important. One thing that I see in the chat over and over again, and I addressed this earlier on, um, so you guys may have joined us late. Um, the answer is capital N, capital O for tenant occupied properties. There are no showings allowed for tenant occupied properties and there are no open houses. There are no exceptions to this. So that directive was extended indefinitely. Um, and so we cannot show tenant occupied properties. We cannot enter tenant occupied properties. We cannot have the tenant um, sign a document that says they will hold us harmless for entering their property um, or that the photographer can enter the property. It's no, no and no. There's no access to tenant occupied properties, no exceptions, no special circumstances, no legal document that can be drafted um, to relieve us or our owners of accessing their property um, for showings and whatnot. However, if we do believe there is a damage to the property or a violation going on, we have to have strong belief and proof that obviously we can, we can enter that property um, as a, a property manager or as the owner. Um, but there are no showings on tenant occupied properties. Um, and no open houses. So I hope I clarified that super clear. Yep. I also want to just point out um, and, and maybe even ask and confirm with you, um, uh, Mark, is that if a tenant is willing to take pictures of the property and send them to the property manager to help market it or get it on the um, MLS or whatever, then that's okay. Um, you can have them do video walkthroughs of the property to check the um, the if there is damage to the property or not, that's okay, but you just can't physically go in. Yeah, and, and the real estate division is actually the key enforcer of that directive. And so I'd have to really refer you over to real estate and that's what we've been doing with those types of questions regarding showing, but that is my understanding. Correct. But a licensed property manager can enter a property to do, or not, sorry, licensed property, manager, licensed property inspector can because they're licensed under a different set of rules and regulations that's not covered um, as, an, as, as a non-entry to the property. So, um, but that doesn't mean that the, um, that everybody can just go through the property with the property manager or with the uh, licensed property inspector. So again, yeah, Molly, Molly, I'll, Molly, I'll jump in just because we're getting a lot of these questions. So, um, so the original open house and in-person showing direct of tenant occupied properties directive is totally separate and distinct from the eviction moratorium. So I think sometimes there's kind of this overlap, but it's, there's confusion that that's like this part of this directive, totally different. Um, from the beginning, 
none of the language has been changed. So the original directive that came out regarding open houses and in-person showings months and months ago, there's been no change language. Our guidance has been- In-person showings for tenant occupied properties. Tenant occupied properties. Our guidance has been once a property is in escrow, um, how do you get an inspector in? How do you get an appraise, appraiser in? And the, that directive didn't go into those details, but in looking at the bigger picture of the stay at home and our discussions between the real estate division, the AG's office, the governor's office, we've all just been in um, agreement that um, once a property is in contract, you just want to limit it. And it's only if the tenant agrees, inspector can come in, appraiser can come in. What we don't want is, um, the, the realtor and five and buyer and five family members coming in, all of that, um, we're gonna get in trouble, things could get pulled back. So we're saying once a property is in escrow, that it kind of changes a little. We've just been giving best practices. It's not in writing anywhere, but we're just giving our best practices um, to make sure that we stay essential. Like we've said from day one, we wanna make sure your business stays essential. And in doing that, we have to really be cautious, especially in tenant-occupied properties. Agreed. And to Vana's point, the, the videos and stuff done by the tenants are great. Um, the other questions we're getting over and over and over again, and this is really important for a property manager to understand, um, is access for repairs, um, access to the property for reaching inspections. Are the inspections back on, or are we still restricted to only if, if it's a, a habitability issues? Tiffany. So again, what we've been saying in our past webinars, we've really just, our interpretation has been habitability issues, not routine inspections. Um, and that is because we keep hoping, hoping that something's gonna open up, that it's been opened up sooner than now. But um, since nothing's changed, we're sticking with the same guidance we've been giving from, given from the beginning. If it's a hot water, um, issue i mean real habitability of course probably tenants gonna want landlord to access but just to do an inspection just to get in or just saying hold off so and get tenants permission obviously yes with proper notice additional questions so i think a lot of these questions are uh duplicates of things that have been answered already um, or that have been provided through articles that have been written by uh, Tiffany as well as um, and I think Crystal's answering quite a bit of it so thank you Crystal for for um, submitting those links to all of the, the stuff um, was there any I, I don't know if we're I think we've gotten to all the questions Molly all but I think there's one here on that we had that came in um, in an email if a tenant defaults on a promissory note lease addendum and is not paying rent, can a landlord PM move for eviction under breach of the promissory note slash lease addendum, or is this covered by the lease eviction moratorium extension? Yeah, that's a great question um, because it really has to do with the interplay of the um, CDC's order now at this point in time. And um, I, I don't have an answer for you at the top, but, but I do ask that you consult with your legal counsel. You can also, um, I mean, obviously you can potentially move forward with uh, the promissory note piece of it, right? That, that's outside of the scope of tenancy. So um, the issue becomes, can you move forward with the eviction um, because it's on a non-payment of rent issue. When we did 025, that was permissible because it was to encourage people to get into reasonable payment agreements. Um, but now with the CDC's order potentially being in play and definitely 031 saying no non-payment of rent evictions, um, it, it's, it's probably best to err on the side of caution. Um, but again, I don't wanna give you legal advice. I want you to definitely talk because I, I think most everything is factually case by case specific. and we handle all the complaints that we get on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I will throw out there though, we still are receiving complaints from landlords um, and in some cases, uh, difficulty to get in touch with tenants, things like that are some of the nature of the complaints. And we have been handling those and trying to um, connect tenants with landlords as well. So you can still file complaints with our office. Um, it's not just for tenants. And I, and I made that clear on the last um, webinar we had as well. 
That's a great point because we do have tenants that don't want to respond, don't think they have to respond. Again, they're under the impression that they're just covered. Um, they don't have to do anything until December 31st or January 1st. And so if, if we do have um, those struggles, then it's good that we can reach out to the AG's office for, for their support in that. That's, that's important. Yeah, we, we'll try to assist what we can. I mean, we, we can make no promises that we will actually be successful, just like you're having difficulty, but, but we'll definitely try. Super. One of the things I do want to clarify, and then I've seen on the chat back and forth regarding the CDC's um, order, um, they don't have to complete the form that is online. They can create their own document. Uh, it doesn't have to be legal. It doesn't have to be notarized. It, doesn't, it just has to have all parties to the lease, all tenants um, that are on the lease. They need to answer those questions um, and attest to those questions and hand that document to either the property manager or the landlord. And that is that. That's the end of it. It makes it very, very simple. In the beginning, we thought, oh, you know, we don't know how many tenants are actually going to go through this process. Um, but it's not an arduous process at all. So we need to be careful that if we are served that declaration, um, again, with the penalties that are out there, um, that we take it seriously and uh, that, that our landlords understand as well um, the seriousness of that declaration. And it can be served, as, as Megan said earlier, um, at the doorstep when the sheriff is there to lock them out. They can just scribble out down their answers, sign it, and hand it over, and they are protected. Um, so it's, it's certainly... Um, uh, a very open type of situation, something simple for them to, to do. Um, so let's make sure that we're not expecting it to be some type of a notarized um, directive uh, or declaration uh, that comes across on a specific form. It can be any format. And then um, I did want to, Teresa had, had made a comment. She wanted us to let everybody know that we are gonna have uh, the judges back on. Uh, for a webinar in the next few weeks so that we can answer some of these questions that uh, we've been directed to sort of, let's see what the court says. And, and so they will be coming back on and I think that will be helpful. And I'll, and I'll jump in and I know um, Chief Deputy Kruger can also attest to, um, you know, that the judges in, in our discussions have made it very clear that it is gonna truly be a case by case basis and, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, if you've heard something different, but that it's really going to be um, when that case is in front of them, what they're arguing, whether the CDC applies and um, or or this Directive 031. Um, now we can come out with some best practices on how to craft, you know, the argument so one applies over another. But um, like Deputy Kruger said earlier, the important piece is that the lease addendum also is a promissory note. Um, which was a critical piece um, before in us drafting that. So there's something else that can be used. So to remember that and also um, really keep in mind when we talk about the 30 day no cause, there really is cause. And, and I, again, we just, we've gotten so many questions these last few days about this. So I, I just wanna clarify this, that the cause is either the lease is up or it's on a month to month. And so we're giving them the 30 day notice that really is to gain possession, to vacate. So you still have other tools to go after the monetary piece. So I just wanted to clarify that because I know that we've just been kind of flooded with how, how am I going to get paid the arrears if I'm not doing a seven day pay or quit? So I wanted to also clarify that. Uh, Tiffany, you're absolutely correct. And you know, again, no cause is a term of art that came into the world. You won't find it in the statutes of Nevada for tenancy law. Um, what it is is an unlawful detainer action. And based upon the unlawful detainer, somebody staying in past the lease terms um, is the reason you're moving forward. But to answer someone's question, it it does not, it cannot be used for non-payment of rent. There is no um, way to evict for non-payment of rent currently under Directive 031 and potentially under Directive the CDC's order as well. Um, uh, the complaints can be filed at the AG's office at ag.nv.gov. Thank you. And I'm, we're still getting a little bit of confusion on the non-payment and the declaration. Um, oh, the declaration is um, the CDC order requires a declaration. Again, Directive 031 does not require a declaration. It automatically applies. The CDC order requires the declaration to be completed. Um, it basically appears the intent is that they want to show that these elements have been met by the individual under penalty of perjury. Um, 
with the understanding that they could too get charged a hundred thousand hundred thousand dollar fine individually and up to one year in jail for for supposedly entering into this declaration with you know not perjuring himself in so doing but um but it's important um because that's the way that they're saying we can't pay we don't have the funding to pay we've been hit by covid all the elements that are required on the declaration and the landlord then cannot move forward under the cdc's order for non-payment of rent eviction and again remember it, really critically right now 031 applies such that you can't move forward for non-payment of rent evictions um, at this time under the state's order. And if we remember what Megan said earlier, even if, so again, we need to make sure we're understanding this separately. Even if we have non-payment of rent and we have a holdover um, or a month to month tenant and we wanna serve the 30 day, um, Megan said that likely what she's seeing happening already is that the tenants are still being allowed to stay into the property, all right, until that December 31st date. Everybody's gonna act differently. So if you file for non-payment of rent, then obviously the CDC and the governor's directives are gonna say no, that's, you can't do that. But if you have a lawful detainer um, and where you have a holdover or you have somebody whose lease is coming up and you wanna give them that 30 day notice, um, you can go ahead and file that, whether or not the judge is going to look at that and attest to the CDC saying, no, we can grant that, or, or, or yes, we can grant it, or no, we can't grant it. That will depend on e each individual judge, which is why we hope to get them on a webinar soon to get an idea of how we think they're going to uh, handle those types of actions that come before them. The other thing I want to remind you is, even when we do serve um, a seven-day pay or quit or a five-day um, that the, the system is only open Monday through Thursday. And so that's four days. And then you have the next week, which so it's in essence, it really could take up to two weeks. And so we want to prepare our landlords. It's not just seven days, you know, we serve it on this, the first and it's heard and done by the eighth. Um, it could take a full two weeks for it to get heard and then and move from there. So uh, we've got to make sure we're preparing our landlords for proper timelines as well. Does anybody else have any final comments? Teresa, Tiffany, Crystal? Um, I'll just jump in. One other question that we, that was a really frequently asked question this last week for us is, um, what happens if the tenant does not leave after the 30 day notice? Do you have to file another notice? And so um, it's our understanding that, that yes, you do have to do a five day following the 30 day. That, that's correct. There's an unlawful detainer five-day notice that has to be given following the 30-day notice if the tenant doesn't leave. Well, I have to jump onto another call, but um, but yeah. I want to thank you guys again, and, and re please feel free to reach out to me if you have any additional questions. We appreciate you being on the call. Thank you, and thank you for all your help. All right. Thanks so much. Super. Well, I think that wraps up this uh, property management uh, PAG session, our fifth one. Uh, look for the sixth one, which will be coming up. We are going to get the judges, um, really, which is who we want to hear from now that we have some more clarity on the directive and on the CDC order. Um, really, is how is that going to be interpreted um, in the justice system? And that's going to be very, very important. Um, so if you missed a part of this webinar or you want to uh, send it off for other people to view, please do. Please share it. The more people that we can educate, Again, the better that we can operate and keep ourselves and our clients uh, protected is, is always going to be the best way to, to move forward. Um, so NBR's YouTube channel is filled with lots of goodies. Um, and then to Vanana's point earlier, the AG's office does have really great Q&As. We continue to use those Q&As because again, they're not coming from us as property managers. So we're not the ones that they're yelling back at. Um, or well, they can yell back at us. But at the same time too, we're not making the rules. We're just helping educate uh, both the tenants and the landlords as to where things are. Um, so I hope that gave you guys a little bit more insight and some more clarity. I'm sure the next time we talk, we'll have another directive or something um, to, to unpack, um, but always email us, keep us posted, reach out to uh, NVR's hotline. They're very, very responsive, a lot of great information. So thank you everybody for your time and uh, stay safe. Go out there and keep being great. <laughs>